Hello, and welcome to another episode of Climbing on the Bookshelf. This one is for all you Everest and 8,000 metre peak nutters, as I sit down and talk with Mick Conifray, an award-winning documentary maker and writer of Himalayan literature. His current book, The Last Great Mountain, The First Ascent of Kanjunjunga, is the story of Joe Brown's and George Band's first ascent of the mountain in 1955, and the expeditions that led up to it. You can purchase the book from Amazon. Some of the interview is a bit quiet and squeaky, but it's a really fascinating interview that I did at the end of August. I hope you enjoy it. So I'd like to welcome Mick Conifray. Mick, welcome to Climbing on the Bookshelf. Thank you for your time and coming on the show um, and having a chat about mountaineering books. Oh, yeah, I'm delighted. And was that the um, the right way to pronounce your surname? Uh, well, it's one of those names which is a little bit difficult. because it's Okay. Hard. And if it was, I always say to people, if it was O'Conifray, they would get it. <laughs> okay, but, yeah. Honestly, you, are, you are pretty close, actually. A lot of, I get a lot of cone fries. And okay, sure. Fries. Even from people who've known me for years, they still can't pronounce my name. I yeah, think, sure. If I was called Mick O'Conifray, then they'd say, ah, I get, I get it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So maybe I should change it by deed poll. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you've, I've, I've noticed that you've had got three books out. Um, or you've written three books from what I can see. Um, is there all about the first ascents of the three tallest mountains in the world? Um, what sort of gave you the idea to, to sort of to write them? Well, actually, I have done more, um, but the okay. other were different. The, um, I did a couple of TV books to go with TV series that I did. And then I did a couple of books which were much more playful in form. One was called The Adventurer's Handbook and the other one was called How to Climb Mont Blanc in a Skirt. Well, it was looking, it was a kind of trying to find a different way to talk about the history of exploration. And the yeah. other one was about female explorers. And I had made a film about um, the first ascent of Everest for the BBC in, I think, 2003. And at okay. the time, I was kind of surprised that that nobody had really written a book about it since nineteen since the nineteen fifties. You know, when the the first ascent happened, there was what you called an official account, um, which came out, and then Edmund Hillary wrote a book, and a couple of the other climbers involved in it wrote a book. But really, you know, after that, there were no single books written about it. And we, obviously it appeared in lots of other books, kind of like Global Histories of Everest or whatever, but there was yeah. no single book about it. And I thought, well, that this seems bizarre to me because it, there's a lot to say about it, which isn't in the official history. And and in a way, I, I always thought that it had been slightly sidelined because it was a sort of in, in some kind of respects a... Uh, a victim of its own success, that everybody said, oh, it went with military precision clockwork. And I thought, well, that's not really true because I'd interviewed all of the surviving members of the, the Everest team and there were plenty of them in, in 2002 and 2003. And um, so so anyway, so so then 10 years later, I kind of thought, well, it's a 60th anniversary <laughs> coming up. So, you know, everybody always loves anniversaries, don't they? So... Um, so, so, so I kind of went away and I researched and, um, and, and wrote that book. And so that was, so I'd written the Everest book. And then I'd also made a film about K2. And I, I didn't really think there was as much new to say about K2. But when I'd done the TV film, I'd always, I'd felt that there was a lot of material which we'd collected, which hadn't found a home in an hour's worth of television. So, so I thought it was worth doing, and and then but then subsequently it became much more interesting than I'd originally thought because I, I when we made the film we focused on American ascents in the nineteen thirties and and fifties, yeah. but we didn't look at the Italian ascent, and uh, I, I had no idea that it was so interesting and so controversial. Okay, and and so that was you know that was so that made it very interesting to write Cause... because I kind of felt there. A little bit like the Everest one, but that that um, that I had something new to say about it, you know. And but it was a particularly sort of vexatious controversy. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people thought I can't possibly say some of these things, but but nevertheless, they're all born out of proper research. So anyway, so I'd written those two. Yeah. And then I thought, uh, oh, well, I, I'm never going to climb all three 
of the highest mountains in the world. I wouldn't climb one of them, but it'd be nice to write a trio of books. And so I started looking for a, a publisher to, to put out a book about Kanchenjunga. But unfortunately, it, uh, I couldn't find anybody. And they all said the same thing. Oh, we like the idea. We like, no, they, they, we like the writing and like your other books, but we just don't think this one is going to sell because uh, nobody's ever heard of it and nobody can pronounce it. And sure. yeah. so, um, and also I didn't at that point have anything to hook it onto. It was no anniversary to, that it, um, it, 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 it would coincide with. So anyway, so, but after doing this for a couple of years, I, I started writing it. I went to Kanchenjunga um, and, okay. um, and I thought, no, I'm going to write it and I'll self-publish it. And I was lucky enough to have a friend who worked in digital publishing okay. at uh, Brooks University in Oxford. And he helped me typeset it and design the book and did everything in terms of putting it on, you know, making it available. And so we published it and yeah. put it out on Amazon and and uh, through a company called Ingram Spark, we're able to distribute it on paper. So, okay. um, you know, so I, I was sort of, you know, I, and the, the irony of it is even though the first ascent is British, I couldn't find a British publisher for it. I found a publisher in Poland for it. It's about to come out in Italy. Yeah. Um, so other people seem to be interested in it, even if I couldn't find a British. Yeah, because that was the first British one, wasn't it, I guess? It, well, it was, yeah, yeah, it was the first, you know, well, Everest was, obviously, but uh, the, if you wanted, if you wanted, kind of, it depends whether you think Edmund Hillary was British. In 1953, they did. By 2003, yeah. perhaps they, they thought he was a Kiwi, you know. <laughs> he thought of himself as a Kiwi, but... Um, you know, so but, but it was also the 55 was the first ascent of Kenshin Jugger, and, and it was in some respects a more notable achievement than the first ascent of Everest, you know, for how trying it was. And that was, um, I'm trying to think what his name is, Joe Brown. Yeah, the, wasn't it? I think, yeah, yeah, the, the, the it was a very interesting, I can't remember the George, was, someone the other guy, I think, I can't remember yeah. what his name is. Yeah, the, the interesting thing was that, uh, it was the you know, it really, it is true that until the until the mid nineteen fifties, the uh, f most big British mountaineering expeditions to the, the Himalayas were filled with people from the same kind of schools, the same kind of class, the same kind of universities. And nineteen fifty five, Kanchenjunga Jungle was changed things because for once, for the first time, really, you got somebody who's from a very different world, um, and that was Joe Brown, who yeah. was very young you know, much younger than most of the people who'd gone to the Himalayas, um, who was working class, who was a builder. Um, uh, yes. And he was a, 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 a totally different kind of character. I mean, there, there had been others. There'd been Alf Gregory was a, a travel agent who was part of the Everest 1955 team, but he, he was much okay. older and a more established sort of guy. Whereas Joe Brown really was a sort of, I was thought of him as this sort of, although this, this will show you how old I am. He was a sort of Theo Walcott. And it was a bit like that. But uh, but Joe Brown then subsequently turned out to be one of the great British climbers. And, yeah, yeah, because he climbed uh, quite a bit with um, Don Willans, I think I remember, as well. He did quite a lot of stuff with him. Yeah, uh, the other person who was with him, though, George Band, was equally impressive and interesting. He had been on Everest in 1953, but had had a terrible stomach problems, which put him out of action yeah. for most of the key part of the expedition. So... Um, and he was totally, he was exactly the Oxbridge public school boy. Um, Moving on to, um, actually, have you got any plans to write any more books? Um, maybe the next highest one? Uh, well, people uh, Lotzi or something like that. Uh, uh, no, I'm actually just finishing a book now coming out next year, which is the prequel to my Everest book, which is uh, called uh, Everest 1922. Okay, can you can you is it can you talk a bit about that? Uh, well, Everest 22 is the story of the first expedition, and uh, okay. which happened in 1922. It was a reconnaissance expedition in 1921, but the first attempt on Everest proper. Yeah, 22, and. Um, it's very interesting because a little bit like the the 1953 Everest expedition, it, it, it sort of never quite got the attention that it deserved because okay. everybody became very focused on what happened in, in on the following expedition when Mallory and Irving disappeared. 
And so yes. you know, most people are interested in, you know, did they get to the top, the moot point, the only interesting question. But mm-hmm. what what is interesting about 1922 is that it is it is the first, you know, proper big Himalayan ex- expedition that it yeah. sort of set the pattern for, for everything to come really for the next sort of 40, 50 years, arguably. Um, yeah. and, um, and it has these great characters in it. Um, people like George Finch, uh, the Australian scientist, George Mallory, okay. the school yeah. teacher, General Bruce, the <laughs> archetypal larger than life character. Yeah. So it's populated with these kind of quite interesting, sometimes eccentric characters. And um, like 1953, it has, you know, it, it was seen as a sort of something of national importance or certainly yes, it's all going to whip it up into that. And and so it has quite a lot of tension involved because there's a lot riding on its success or failure. And uh, and so that's that makes it very interesting. And and you know what was great about this early period yeah. um, was that everybody kept lots of paperwork or everybody generated lots of, of paperwork at the time and and most of it was kept you know so, so there's a lot of accounts of everything yes a lot of accounts a lot of diaries a lot of le- letters you know um there's a mass of material in the uh, uh royal geographical society and yeah you know, by drawing on that and sort of you know triangulating all these different accounts of the same event, you can kind of come up with quite a rich, interesting picture, you know. And yeah. and, and as I say, it's a very kind of character-driven story. And the characters are, are good because they're quite clearly defined. And uh, um, and it's full of kind of incident and there's a great sense of kind of culture clash with all these Brits going off to Tibet <laughs> and encountering all these things that they're... <laughs> They, they, they've got no understanding of and, the, yeah. the, and equally the Tibetans being a bit bemused by what they're doing, you know, but, um, and so it's very exotic and it's just, it's a good, you know, I was drawn to all of these things for looking for, you know, I'm interested in sort of, you know, telling good tales. Yeah, you know, like exploration and things tales. like that, yeah. Yeah, that, that they, they, they sort of have good characters and, yeah tension and there's drama and things go right and things go wrong um and um you know and, and also the, the the kind of good thing about about everest you know in compar- the, the, the difficulty with the book i did about kanchen jungle was that you know I, I looked at the other attempts on it from prior to the successful british attempt and um it, it involved lots and lots of topographical descriptions of things using you know all your technical language of arrets and and things which which are very hard to get across on paper really and uh, but that was necessarily part of it because everybody was kind of trying it from different sides so some would have a go from nepal and some would have a go from um the sikkimese side and then somebody yeah. else would try from a slightly different bit of nepal um and they're, they're, all the trips were kind of complicated. The, the mountain topography was complicated. Whereas for the first ep- um, expedition to Everest from the Tibetan side, it's actually pretty simple. You know, you go along a big glacier, you climb up to this feature called the Nor- North Col. Then you get onto this other feature, which is very straight ridge, which takes you, you know, to within about 1500 foot of the summit called the um, the North Ridge. And okay. and then after that you head for the summit and it gets a bit more complicated, but it's still quite easy to follow and easy to understand. Yeah. Whereas some of the the you know particularly some of the German expeditions to Kanchen Junga, they're very hard to kind of to quite understand what's going on because the, the the actual terrain is so complicated that they're going across. You know. Yeah. So um, so again, I think it kind of makes it easy to follow, easy to understand. You know. So. With these books, did you get to travel to the mountains and see them firsthand? Yeah. Obviously, you, you went up to the Royal Geographical Society to have a look at paperwork and things like that. But I'm just interested if you actually got out to, to see it for yourself and kind of be in awe of them and how big they are. Yeah, well, I, I was lucky that I'd been to Everest and, and K2 to make documentaries. I'd been to all of those, to those mountains. And then 
Yes, for Kanchenjunga, I went out to Kanchenjunga. I didn't climb it; I just trekked to the base camp. Sure, yeah. Um, and uh, for this, for the Everest Twenty Two book, um, I've been doing it over the last couple of years. When obviously, um, you know, in the coronavirus period, so I very much like to go to Tibet, but Tibet has been closed to um, all outsiders um, basically since the sort of beginning of lockdown in. In, in you know um, the beginning of the coronavirus, so it hasn't yeah. been able to get out. I, I, I was trying to concoct a plan with a friend to go and <laughs> follow some of the the route. Moving on to um, books from your past or reading books from your past, um, were there any books that kind of stand out for you that kind of inspired you to to get into mountaineering literature and 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 exploration? You know, I, I was very much a kind of voracious. I've always been, you know, quite a big reader from childhood. And um, and so, you know, so, so I've always read a lot. But, but you know, if I'm honest with you, not really in terms of mountaineering literature. That, that came when I was researching the documentaries. So when I was doing that. But I also tried as far as possible to to interview people when they were survivors. So I interviewed Joe Brown. And yeah. I, yeah, the um, Charles Evans widow and you know I, I much prefer to meet okay. people than to spend my time simply reading books but um, and but then I did read a lot of mountaineering books you know in the process of doing the research yeah there's sort of it, 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 it's an interesting field I don't I don't know who I love Eric Shipton's books very funny very light or not not, not funny but they're, they're kind of witty and they they, they move quickly is a fantastic autobiography and it makes you really envious of his life. I liked him and I liked Bill Tillman, his climbing partner, and I think he, he's fantastic. The, the expedition accounts often tended to be, you know, they'd be banged out very quickly after um, after the expeditions in order to make money, really, to sort of capitalise on the publicity. So yes, that's they're right, not yeah. fantastic yeah. of literature. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I mean, I remember <laughs> like what you've just done, being you know really fascinated by into thin air because you know there you yeah. have a journalist um you know who was you know quite a, a good journalist in quite a few books before that in the middle of a kind of fantastic story you know and i'm not i'm i am i do not think he wanted to go there and find lots of dead bodies and sort of, <laughs> lots of i don't think that was his gone. plan no no yeah I, I don't think that was the issue but you know it was a fantastic Eye opener to that world, which sort of was so different to you know the, 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 that what what you'd previously read about, you know, yeah. and uh, so I thought that was a terrific book, and I liked. Um, there's a book called The Last Blue Mountain, to, uh, a mountaineering disaster in the Himalayas, which is fantastic. But it, it starred. There was a character called Tony Strether, who was a brilliant British mountaineer who was on K2 and Kanchenjunga. And yeah. um, and it was a tale of a kind of terrible, terrible disaster, uh, with an amazing, you know, amazing story of of survival as well. Yeah, friends. sure. So, yeah. I mean, you, what you appreciate in in these kind of books is is seeing what happens to people under extreme pressure, and, yes. and that's a great book about people under the most extreme pressure. You know. Yeah. I'm just in the in the middle of reading um, Ed Caesar's book, The Moffin Mountain. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a quite an interest, a rollicking adventure sort of thing, right. you know. Right. That's um, that's that's really good. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm enjoying that. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's a great story because it combines together both. Um, you know, it, 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 it's a story of personal trauma. It's a story of the First World War. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's flying yeah. story you know and it's yeah. a mountaineering story so it's a fantastic crossover book written with a lot of sort of verve and sort of personality to it as well yeah so, yeah yeah it's, 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 but it's a great story um yeah i mean i, I don't know for recent but i mean i lo love stephen venable's books are fantastic um the first brit to climb Everest without oxygen, and I think he's terrific. David Roberts, who unfortunately a few weeks ago wasn't it? Yes, yeah. yes, uh, yeah. He, he's a very good. The Last Blue Mountain is by Ralph Barker. Okay, uh, I'll have to look that one uh, out. Yeah, definitely. Or the expedition to Mount Haramush. Okay, it's kind of 
it's available now now but yeah. um okay. i liked walter bernati's books as well he was but again he had a kind of great life it's that sort of era the sort of 30s 40s and 50s you know that's sort of my kind of that's what i like most about the sort of mountaineer literature those sort of sort of pre post war sort of era where things were very very rudimentary and they did suffer but they still just got on and did it and you know it's it's i find it really interesting yeah i think it's i i, I was t- talking about this to somebody recently about you know the, the kind of comparisons that you could make between um the climbers of the 1920s and the, and and you know and you, because you're kind of looking at at what they did and trying to work out how, how they did it and you know yeah. i you do wonder sometimes if if they were just a lot physically tougher than we would be now you know if you think about yeah. edward norton the the british climber and howard somerville yeah. getting to within a thousand feet of everest on 1924 nobody knows really what happened to mallory and irving but you can definitely you know we know for certain that um that edward norton got to within a thousand foot of the summit and yeah. and knew when to stop <laughs> and came back alive you know uh, wearing you know fairly rudimentary clothing with um rudimentary footwear ice axes you know they, they were all able to endure phenomenal cold and horrible you know terrible weather and yeah. um and you know if, or if you read going further back the um accounts of edward wimper the victor i love edward wimper's books they're fantastic um, yeah the Victorian mountaineer, but you know, he, he would walk from London to Edinburgh and not think anything of it. So I've been to the Andes and, um, you know, he, I, I've been up some of the volcanoes that he went up and, and he would write, oh, you know, we just, we strolled up Cotopaxi and it was so easy. I didn't understand what all the fuss was about. And then we moved over to Ch- Chimborazo. Yeah. It really is an easy mountain. It, it, there's nothing to say about it. You think, I said, well, Chimborazo is quite hard actually. And you think, well, how can he be saying this? Is he? Do, is it an act of bravado on his behalf? Was it that the yeah. topography was slightly different to how it is now? Yeah, as it's changed, yeah, the city, yeah, quite so much. Or, or was it that he really thought nothing of it? He really thought this is an absolute doddle. Uh, so um, you know, I think that uh, yeah. So so that is intriguing that for the people from that period, the sort of whereas you know now you kind of sure there are people who are very tough and very hardy and, um but equally they they they're frequently co- cocooned in technology and yeah so the equipment and things of of is what's brought it on and made it not easier but but it's it's helped a lot i think yeah i mean that i mean obviously on the other hand i mean you have to take your hats off to um Reinhold Messner and Alex Honnold absolutely yes that they are you know, in his day, I mean, probably there's never going to be somebody like Reinhold Mesner again because, I mean, he was just phenomenal. I mean, uh, yeah, and that had nothing to do with equipment. It was just to do with, you know, sheer fitness and toughness and yeah, single focus, you know. And obviously Alex Honnold is a phenomenal free climber. Uh, yeah. It's a slightly different thing, but... But as I say, what interests me is just to know, you know, well, these Victorians, they kind of slept with their windows open, bathed in cold water. You know, the things that we now think, yes. are, the things that, you know, you, you read about it in the Sunday Times and they say have a cold shower and it'll be good for you. They just did it by <laughs> naturally. So, um, yeah, so it does make them interesting. You know. If you, um, obviously you've, you've travelled quite a lot, um, either research or or whatever you were doing um have you got a favorite place that you just sit down and think yeah this is this is an amazing place i, I mean i have to say I, I um have really enjoyed the times i've been in nepal um yeah. and I, I saw some photographs the other day of, of south korea uh, which in fact has got a lot of mountain and um and it had it was this amazing picture which just showed layer upon layer of mountains of different height in uh south korea and it reminded i think me... i might have seen that as well yeah oh, okay well it, it reminded me of some of the kind of vistas you got in nepal not not around the really big mountains but slightly further inland you know sl- slightly further south of the himalayas yeah and uh um where you would get these kind of just beautiful 
layers of hills and then they would change colour and you know and that was really and the clouds and the mist between them and things yeah, like that and yeah in room. so um so i do, do like nepal i've been um i do like alaska it's a fantastic place have you do you when you when you go away um and do the research and stuff do you take a book with you to make notes in and um a tape recorder not tape record i'm sounding old-fashioned now um and kind of interview people that oh, I, are about. If I was interviewing people, yes, I would use a um, a little digital voice recorder. Yeah. And, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm chained to my laptop, which goes everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as I say, the thing is, you, there's no substitute for finding original material, and you want to get down to the nitty gritty of going through. Sometimes it's frustrating because you will have a correspondence where you've only got one half of it and you're trying to work out oh, what did the other person say and yeah. what does this response really mean you know so you, you, you know you, you can kind of fool yourself by finding a lot of archive into thinking that you've got all of it but you can never quite know whether you've got all of it but but certainly it's exciting to kind of come across George Mallory's letters in the original or the original camp <laughs> diaries from <laughs> from the 1920s of um, which they had as they were going up Everest, you know, and, yeah. and they're fantastic documents. You can get now, like a lot of the stuff increasingly, which is great in some respects, increasingly it's becoming available online. Yeah. A lot of the RGS's archive will soon be available in, in other libraries, but there's nothing like the kind of tactile quality of, of sort of, you know, finding a book of old telegrams or sometimes <sighs> cursed with people with terrible handwriting. <laughs> and looking at these letters and thinking, can I be bothered to spend an hour transcribing these things, which I can barely read? Because I've I've seen that there there are the um, Alpine Club has released some back issues of of paperwork and things, and you can that's all online and magazines, yeah. and that's yeah. that's that's really good to see those from from that sort of you know past explorations and expeditions. That's that's really interesting to see. Digital stuff is great, and again, in the year of, of, of coronavirus, you want to be able to kind of um, to make things accessible, and this is a way to yeah. make accessible. But it's it, it, you know, as I say, there's an excitement of actually touching, yeah, of the going things. there and seeing the things at yeah. first hand. Yeah. yeah. Are there any books that you want to read or know that are, know that are um, coming up, and you think, yeah, I'm, I must get that when it comes out, or Climbing books, um, mountaineering or adventure books, or any of that sort of genre, really. Well, I mean, it's sort of difficult to, to know. I mean, yeah. uh, what is going to what people are going to write about? I mean, obviously, Alex Honnold and Conrad Anker and um, those Americans who did that free solo in Yosemite. Yeah, they're very busy at the moment, so uh, um, it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. It'll be interesting to see whether anybody will come out with a new take on the um the Mallory and Irving story there was a book recently by Mark Sinot but I, I don't know you know now we're getting to the to levels of of slightly strange conspiracy theories the, the latest of which appears in his book which is the the idea that that um Irving's body will never be found because it's been stolen by the Chinese. <laughs> Truth is often stranger than fiction, but that fiction, but that seems to me to be very, very unlikely. I mean, yeah. but uh but to see whether anybody comes up with a new version of that, we, we shall have to we shall have to see. I don't know. Yeah, because it was Comrade Anker and David Roberts that wrote the book about him finding his body. Yeah. Mallory's body on there and that was quite an interesting yeah. read but obviously there are other reports like you said the the Synop book as well that has just come out and there's always something that somebody else is trying to disprove and things like that yeah well I mean you know ultimately there is a sort of there is a it was, it, you know there was a limit really I mean what, what 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 was interesting when I did my book on K2 and looked at the the controversy at the end as to whether they yeah. actually reached the summit climbing on oxygen or not. Um, yeah. A lot had been written about this, and this had been in a very heated and vitriolic way uh, because the personalities involved um, were, you know, were very strong egos and, uh, and they really yeah. went at each other. 
and um, and then there were other people who picked up on the story and and taken one side or another. Um, and then some people had looked at the photographic evidence and and come said, ah, oh, well, this is definitive. This proves everything exactly, you know. Um, but the interesting thing was that nobody had looked at the film footage because it was very inaccessible, you know, that until yes. comparatively recently you couldn't get this stuff on DVD, you know, so, so it just wasn't shown, it wasn't available. And so, so all these debates have been going on, but nobody had actually bothered looking at the the original film and then if you read the yeah. original film you know it, it did give you a new take on it because whereas black and white photographs are kind of single moments in time um you know color movies tell a kind of a different story a much more rounded story because there's information in the color that you kind of it's not just what happens in a particular moment it, it's what happens around that moment yeah and yeah. um you know but so with <laughs> obviously mallory and Irvin, the kind of there has been this notion that if, if you ever find the camera, you will be able to prove whether they they managed to get to the summit or not, which is obviously, you know, it's kind of rather dubious. Uh, um, but nevertheless, that still fuels a lot of uh, um, of searches and it gets people very excited and stuff. Yes. But, uh, yeah. But I would also like to see what Alex Hummel does next and and the books that he writes about his further kind of, I think they've all been down in the Antarctic. So far, the, the mountains of the moon have been in yeah. Africa near to Uganda and Rwanda, but, you know, it won't be that long before the, the real mountains of the moon will be climbed, and we'll have to see what the yes. accounts of those will be like. Yeah, it's been, it's, it's been really good speaking to you. Thank you so much. All right, then. Lovely to um, speak. Cheerio. Thank you.